Welcome to the Covenant Podcast. The Covenant Podcast exists to equip listeners with theological content from a 1689 Baptist perspective. We are on the Man of God Network, brought to you by Covenant Baptist Theological Seminary. And in this conversation, you're going to be hearing a Sunday school lesson that Dewey Doval gave to Emmanuel Reformed Baptist Church in SeaTac, Washington, on an overview of John Gill. Uh, if you haven't uh, picked up on it, uh, John Gill is someone that we like to talk about on this podcast, probably because of how immensely useful uh, he has been to the ministries of Jimmy Johnson, Dewey Doval, and myself. Uh, his commentaries through scripture and his uh, body of doctrinal and practical divinity, those works have been very useful for us. And so we like to talk about him a lot, whether that's uh, his life, whether that's specific areas of his theology. Many of you know that we're doing a Gill group. Uh, Pastor Ken Glish is also involved in those conversations on Gill group. So we would encourage you to go back and listen to our first two Gill groups. Uh, But in this specific episode, uh, if you're listening, you'll hear a overview of John Gill. If you're watching, you'll get to see the video of Pastor elect Dewey Doval uh, presenting an overview on John Gill's life. Uh, thank you for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoy this lecture given by Dewey Doval. Here we are this morning uh, looking at John Gill instead of Exodus 34. So um, some of you probably, as you hear this, this uh, report from me, you're sitting here thinking, John Gill, are we really going to spend an entire Sunday school class talking about some dead guy, some dead theologian? Well, uh, my prayer is that this this dead guy, this dear brother in Christ who's with our Lord uh, even today, my prayer is that he would uh, be a means of encouraging us, that we would be richly edified by considering his life and his ministry and all of the ways that God used him in his respective contexts. And to that end, there's really three main objectives that I hope to accomplish over the course of our Sunday school class. The first objective that I hope to accomplish today is to provide us with a flyover sketch of John Gill's life and his ministry. Secondly, I want to introduce us to some of the key distinctives of John Gill's theology. And then thirdly, I I want to suggest why Baptists should consider studying John Gill, and really as Emmanuel Reformed Baptist Church, why we should find value in studying John Gill. So each of these main objectives, that's going to really structure the way that we approach this particular lesson today in Sunday school. So if you're taking notes, if you're trying to keep an outline of where we're going to be headed again, number one, flyover sketch of John Gill's life and ministry. Number two, John Gill's theology. And then thirdly, why we as Baptists should study John Gill in the 21st century. So um, with that outline in mind, having been said by way of preface, let's pray together. Let's ask for God's favor on this time of Sunday school. I trust that the Lord will bless our time uh, as we seek his face. So let's pray and we'll get started. Our Father in heaven, we again come on this Lord's Day with hearts that are full of anticipation and, and hearts that are eager to see what you have in store for us as a local church body. And as we come to this particular hour of Sunday school, we look to a brother in Christ who has long departed from this life and is with you and all believers in glory, even as we pray this prayer. And we do pray, Father, that our time of of studying this, this man of church history, that it would be useful to us, that it would not merely be an opportunity for us to engage in hagiography or to make much of a a sinner who is just like us, someone who is in dire need of a Savior in and of himself. Father, would we never engage in worshiping any creature or putting another man or woman on a pedestal that only you and your Son and Holy Spirit deserve to be on. Rather, Father, it is our prayer that as we look to John Gill this morning, as we look to how you used his life, as we look to his theological convictions, and even as we consider some of the practical applications that we can derive from studying Gill today, it's our prayer, Father, that we would ultimately be encouraged to look to you, that our eyes and our minds and our hearts would be lifted up together as individuals and as a congregation as we reflect on how you use sinners to accomplish your eternal purposes, for how you glorify yourself and the salvation of those of us who 
who were completely unworthy and undeserving of your grace, and yet, Father, you lavish us in so many ways. So, Father, as we come now to this study, we pray that you would give us much focus, that you would give us much attention to all that will be spoken this morning. Um, Father, help us to, to not merely zone out as, as early as it is and as this, this lesson will be a little bit more biographical than is our custom. Father, would this be of great use to us? And even as we consider the ways in which you worked in this man's life some three centuries ago, would you prepare our hearts to behold the gospel and to behold all that we will consider from your word later this morning in corporate worship? and even later this evening as we return in our study to the book of Genesis. But for now, Father, own this time, redeem this time, edify us, sanctify us, even save some of us in our midst who may not know you. For we pray all of this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It wasn't until the summer of 2020 when I really got my first introduction to the life and thought of John Gill. At that particular time, I was taking a historical theology course in my Master of Theology program, and I was assigned to write a paper on a character from Baptist history. In the weeks leading up to receiving the assignment, I either came upon a podcast or an article on John Gill that really intrigued me at the time. I don't remember what it actually was, but Gill was fresh on my mind at this particular season in my life, so I wound up deciding to go forth with writing the research paper on John Gill. And as I begin to study Gill's life, as I begin to reflect on Gill's theology for this paper, I was immediately in awe of what God accomplished through this man. I hope and pray that you as well uh, would find uh, it to be a great significance as, well, as to how God used this figure uh, some three centuries ago. So who was John Gill? We'll start there. John Gill was born on November 23rd, 1697, to Mr. Edward and Mrs. Elizabeth Gill in Northamptonshire, England. Prior to his birth, the Gills were self-identifying dissenters from the church in England, and this resulted in them being a member of a church that was comprised of members uh, from various ecclesiological perspectives, kind of a mishmash of different theological convictions represented in this congregation, people from all different walks of life. But in time, over over the course of a few years, Edward Gill would become convinced that the particular Baptist tradition was the most faithful to Scripture. And as he did so, the Gill family would go on to join a particular Baptist or a Reformed Baptist church that was pastored by a man named William Wallace. In God's providence, the transitioning of Gill's family from a broadly dissenting congregation to a a, a particularly committed Reformed Baptist church, it would set the stage for John Gill's upbringing and really his future in ministry within the context of this 18th century uh, period in church history. And Gill was raised in Kettering, Northamptonshire, and grew up attending the local grammar school He displayed a prolific ability to retain the multitude of subjects that he was learning far beyond that of his classmates. Uh, He was in a class of his own when it came to his intellect as a young man. By the age of 10, Gill had mastered both the Greek and Latin languages, and he would eventually go on to teach himself Hebrew from his own lexicon. Historians have noted that Gill's academic giftedness was so noteworthy that he was thought to have rivaled the school's headmaster in the grasp of the classical languages by his 12th birthday. And Gill's formal academic education would be abruptly halted at his 12th birthday. Uh, The school implemented a policy requiring students to attend the daily prayer services of the church at England. And by virtue of being the son of dissenting parents, Gill officially would withdraw from this local school and he would be unable to continue in formal academic uh, engagements due to the financial constraints that it would put upon his family, and of course, due to broader convictional reasons as well. It's interesting to note that despite Gill's tremendous production of scholarly material throughout the course of his ministry, he never went on to participate in any university educational systems that were present in his day. But be that as it may, in 1748, Gill would go on to receive an honorary doctor of divinity from the University of Aberdeen, And even though 
He never actually went to a, a formal university system. He was affectionately known by many throughout the course of his life as the doctor, Dr. Gill. This due, of course, to his towering intellect that he displayed uh, both in his preaching and in his writing ministries. But Gill maintained a, a very admirable degree of humility, despite being a man of a towering intellect and despite being a man who was highly esteemed by his contemporaries. Uh, according to Gill's own perspective on this lofty title of Dr. Gill, or, or do, just the doctor uh, in general, Gill had this to say in response. And I love this. He said, I neither sought it, nor thought it, nor bought it. That was Gill's perspective of his, of his lofty esteem or status that he had in his day. Uh, in every sense of the term, John Gill was a self-taught Baptist expositor, scholar, and theologian. This was a man who came from the humblest of beginnings, and he never lost sight of, of this perspective. He never lost sight of who he was and where God brought him out of, and, and, and who he eventually would become was deeply shaped and influenced by his humble and unimpressive upbringing. But on that note, back to his childhood, um, despite being raised in a Christian household, Gil would not be converted until the age of 12. It was after hearing a sermon preached on Genesis 3-9 by his pastor's son. So it wasn't even his pastor in the pulpit when he was converted. It was his pastor's son. He's preaching on Genesis 3-9. And as he did so, Gil came to the recognition of his personal need for a Savior. And he would express repentance and saving faith in Jesus Christ at the age of 12. And it would be an additional seven years following that he would undergo baptism as a believer and would shortly surrender his life to God's call to preach the gospel and, and to enter into vocational ministry uh, just a few years after that. So um, he, he would be baptized at the age of 19, and then within just two years after his baptism, um, he's in full-time preaching ministry, and then he comes to be married to Elizabeth Negus in 1718. And you can check me on the spelling of that last name. Uh, not entirely sure. Uh, if it's Negus or Negus, um, but nevertheless, two years after conversion and it, shortly after entering into vocational ministry as a young man, Gil's married in 1718, and the couple would go on to enjoy 46 years of marriage by the grace of God with the marriage ending with Elizabeth's death in 1764. Now, I also love this, this, this often overlooked note of Gil's life and his ministry. By God's grace, the relationship that John and Elizabeth had, it, it was noted by Gill that this was his greatest treasure in his life. Apart from his faith in Jesus Christ, his, his marriage to Elizabeth, this was what he treasured most uh, above all else. This was the highest honor, you could say, that he had as a man. And Benjamin Francis, a, a uh, contemporary of Gill's, he notes the following about Gill's perspective on his marriage. And I, again, I just love this because so often we look to we look to the commentaries and we look to the volumes that a theologian or a figure from church history produces, but we, we can sometimes miss that they were a real man or a, a real woman if you're studying a woman from church history. They had real emotions and real families. And it's really cool when their when their lifestyle outside of the, the formal official ministry actually matches their profession uh, and, and shows itself to be of, uh, of worthy repute, worthy of imitation. Listen to what Francis notes about Gill's marriage. He says, Gill's marriage with Elizabeth was what he always considered as the principal thing for which God in his providence sent him to London. For she proved affectionate, discreet, and careful, and by her unremitting prudence delivered him from all domestic avocations so that he could, with leisure and greater ease of mind, pursue his studies and devote himself to his ministerial work, end quote. So this was a wife who fully supported Gill's calling to ministry, and he was immensely grateful for how she was a, a, a very edifying and encouraging helpmeet throughout the course of some 46 years of marriage. Now, like most Christian couples, John and Elizabeth Gill would have to endure their fair share of highs and lows that come with living in a fallen world. From, from um, the start of their marriage to, to the time of Elizabeth's death, they would have to endure miscarriages, 
They would have to endure the death of a child. John Gill actually preached the, the funeral service of his young daughter who passed away. Uh, this is a, by the way, if you're interested in reading something that will just lift your heart up to the gates of heaven, as it were, read this funeral sermon that Gill preached. Now, it's, it's rich. It's, it's, it's not like a funeral sermon that you would hear today. It's rich in, in theology and exegesis, but it's so pastoral and it's so heartfelt for a man to preach the funeral of his, his newly deceased young daughter. Just so powerful to read. But, but Gill, uh, John and Elizabeth Gill, they had hardships. They were not exempt from the difficulties that so many of us have to deal with, whether that's miscarriages, death of a child, persecutions. Gil was a prominent figure in ministry in his context. That came with a lot of, of hardships, a lot of flack, a lot of persecution and ridicule that comes with being in the spotlight. But nonetheless, by God's grace, the Gills were sustained in their marriage for nearly five decades and they were a powerful witness for his renown. And I pray, even if God doesn't call you listening today into a formal vocational ministry context, would God use your marriage, if you're married here today, would He use your marriage in such a way that it's faithful and that it bears witness to God's grace working in you and through you, to those who know you best and to those who have the opportunity to see you interact uh, with others in this world. Whether it's a significant spotlight, whether it's minimal spotlight, you can be a witness through your marriage to the grace of God and the glory of God like the Gills were and like so many other believers are throughout the course of church history, like so many of you are even today as I have had the opportunity to observe your marriage. But in any case, um, where did the Gills live? So we know that they, they were married for 46 years. Well, from March 22nd of 1720 to the time of their respective deaths, John and Elizabeth Gill would live in Horsley Down Southwark, which is located in central London. The Vias could probably tell you exactly where that was as they, they were walking all throughout the streets of London here recently. But Gil, he would go on to pass away in 1771, and he would pastor the same church, Goatyard Chapel, for roughly 52 years. This was a man who was a pastor for over 50 years in the same local church context. And he followed in the footsteps of the great particular Baptist theologian, Benjamin Keach. After Gill, this is just an interesting footnote to Gill's life and ministry. So Gill follows Keach at this church that he pastors for over half a century. Then the famous hymn writer, John Rippon, would go on to follow in his footsteps. He'd actually one-up Gill. He'd be in that ministry context for some 63 years. And then following his tenure, well, actually toward the end of his tenure, the, the congregation there at Goatyard Chapel, they would move their gathering place to New Park Street in Southwark. And then shortly after Ripon's tenure, you have the great Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon, who would go to pastor this same church, and they would go on to move their gathering place once more to South London. And from the time of Spurgeon to the present day, that local church has become known as Metropolitan Tabernacle, and it remains a faithful particular Baptist church under the leadership of Dr. Peter Masters all these years later. So you just have a rich history of Reformed Baptist theology and faithful men in the pulpit for long tenures, decade after decade after decade, starting with Keach in the early 1600s, and then all the way up even to the present day, with some ebbs and some flows between Spurgeon and Masters, but an evangelical church at worst, uh, worst in air quotes, and a uh, Reformed Baptist church at its best, and we praise God for that. But to come back full circle to Gill, when we look at John Gill's life from a 30,000-foot level, I'm going to make a case this morning, as I did in the paper, as we've done uh, in Gill Group on, on our podcast with Covenant Baptist Theological Seminary, I'm going to make the case that John Gill is the most accomplished Baptist theologian of all time. I'll go so far to say he is the greatest Baptist of all time, my personal unbiased opinion. <laughs> amongst his um, mountain, I'm the guy giving the lesson, right? Um, amongst his mountain of accomplishments in ministry, so shifting now to just his ministry, Gill produced a written commentary on every verse in the Bible. He composed a two volume systematic theology that's been regarded as the most robust doctrinal publication in Baptist history. 
When reflecting on Gill's ministry in the 18th century, the great hymn writer Augustus Toplady came to the following conclusion, and I quote, No man alive during his era treated the momentous subject of Calvinism, the system of divine grace in all its branches more closely and judiciously and successfully than Dr. John Gill, end quote. So all in all, we'll get back to some of his accomplishments in just a few moments as we look to his theology and why we should study Gill. But all in all, to land the plane on the biographical section of our Sunday school message. This is a man who was a faithful Christian. He was a faithful husband. He was a faithful father. He was a faithful pastor. He did so with great scrutiny and with great attention for over five decades of life. And as we think about what it means to live the Christian life, this, and I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself with the practical side of things, but this is why we need to study biography. This is why we need to look to those who've walked in faithfulness in the past so we can be encouraged to do the same as we live our lives. Of course, ultimately directing our gaze and attention to the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, But as we think about men and women who faithfully stewarded all that God entrusted to their care in their respective contexts, It's just such a bomb to the soul for us. I want to be like them so God can be glorified in my life. So I can see God's hand really at work in my life. So praise God for how he worked in John Gill's ministry with great breadth and great depth. And I trust that the Lord will continue to raise up such men and women in our day uh, for his purposes and for his glory and for the good of his church. But this is the life of John Gill. Let's look at some of the key distinctives of his theology. For the sake of time and space, I want us just to focus our attention on three of the most foundational characteristics that can be identified from Gill's ministry labor. So three foundational elements or characteristics, you could say, uh, that are relevant to John Gill's theology. The first foundational characteristic could be summarized in this manner, a commitment to classical Trinitarianism, a commitment to classical or you could say orthodox Trinitarianism. It's interesting that within Baptist circles during the 18th century, John Gill was arguably the most important defender of the doctrine of the Trinity. This was an era in which many general Baptists were forsaking key Orthodox convictions on the doctrine of God, but Gill himself was unwavering in his commitment to preserve the the historic Orthodox ecumenical consensus within his own particular Baptist context. He was He was not content to deviate an iota from what the church had historically confessed about the doctrine of God for up to this point, roughly anywhere between 15 to 1700 years. Now, in 1731, Gill publishes one of his most well-known works. It's a treatise on the defense of the Trinity. And in this particular volume, Gill showcases that he was a staunch proponent of Nicene Trinitarianism, the doctrine of eternal generation, and he had a robust understanding of the value of studying church history, particularly historical theology, uh, in order to safeguard the church from drifting into heresies of old. In in other words, since there's nothing new under the sun, from Gill's perspective, we need to be knowledgeable about the errors that have come in generations past so we can avoid them in the present, and of course, so future generations can avoid them as well. So he was a very staunch defender of of the, the orthodox understanding of the doctrine of God within his unique 18th century context. Now, in addition to this, in 1769, Gill goes on to publish his magnum opus entitled A Body of Doctrinal Divinity. And of the seven major sections that we find in this publication, four of them were devoted to teasing out the orthodox articulation of the Trinity. So he's got seven sections in this monumental volume of theology. Over half of it's dedicated to safeguarding sound understandings of the Trinity, a sound doctrine of God. It's estimated that Gill penned over 10,000 folio pages of theological discourse during his 50 plus years of ministry, and there's not a subject that he focused more intently on than the doctrine of God. For Gill, there's nothing more significant. There's nothing more important for the Christian 
than to have a right understanding of who God is. Because it's only when we have a right understanding of who God is that we in turn can have a right understanding of who we are and how creation relates to God. Since all theology originates in God Himself, and since all theology is the self-revelation of God to His image-bearing creatures, Gill was convinced that the purest exercise of theological inquiry begins with possessing an accurate understanding of the doctrine of God. You get God wrong, you're going to get a lot of other things wrong. You get God right, you're going to be on the right trajectory to all of the other major branches and major headings of theology. This was a this was a firm foundational commitment that Gill embraced. And I love this quote in the body of doctrinal divinity. He makes the following argument about the value of studying the doctrine of God. Maybe you're here today and you're like, hey, you know, that's great for, for you know, airhead ivory tower academics. Like, let's study the doctrine of God. Let's study Nicene Trinitarianism. Let's study eternal generation. Yeah, like, that's great for the academics. What about me? I'm, I'm 60 years old. I, I, I work in a factory. I'm a lay person. I'm a stay-at-home mom. What value does this have? That's what Gill would argue. He says, The doctrine of the Trinity is often represented as a speculative point of no great moment, whether it is believed or not, too mysterious and too curious to be pried into, and that it had better be left alone than meddled with. But alas, it enters into the whole of our salvation and all the parts of it into all the doctrines of the gospel, and into the experience of the saints. End quote. What's Gil saying? Not only is all of your theology as a believer going to be impacted by your understanding of God, but your experience as a believer can be greatly impacted by how you understand the nature and character of God. If you flood yourself with right knowledge of God, your heart will overflow with joy with adoration for the God of your salvation. You'll be meditating on the richness of who He is as you saturate your mind and your heart with rich theological resources. So that's an appeal that Gil would make. It's also an appeal that I would make as well. Fill your mind with truth. Find great resources. If you need some some counsel, I, I can get you some good resources on this subject of the doctrine of God to contemplate. But watch how your heart just exudes with with joy and happiness and adoration as you reflect on the nature and character of God. But there's a second foundational characteristic that we can develop from Gill's theology, and this is a high view of God's sovereignty. So again, keeping our focus on God here, we've gone from a right doctrine of the Trinity to now more narrowly conceived, a high view of God's sovereignty. In keeping with classical Christian theism, John Gill wholeheartedly subscribed to what is articulated in paragraph 1 of chapter 2 in our particular Baptist confession or a Reformed Baptist confession, the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith. Gill wholeheartedly believed that God, quote, has most sovereign dominion over all his creatures to do by them, for them, or upon them whatsoever himself pleaseth. I trust that's your conviction today, not just because our confession says it, but because that's what the full counsel of God's word teaches But regardless of denomination, regardless of period in church history, church historians have been hard-pressed to find a figure that has had a more transcendent view of God than John Gill in terms of his sovereignty. But it's John Gill's his high view of God's sovereignty that may have led him a little bit along the lines of error, depending on how you want to conceive this distinctive of his theology. If you've done any study of Gill this morning, you're probably wondering how I would tease this out. One of the most prominent and commendable characteristics of Gill's thought, namely his high view of God's sovereignty, is also one of the most debated elements of his thought regarding whether or not he went into the realm of what's been known throughout history as hyper-Calvinism. What is hyper-Calvinism? Was John Gill a hyper-Calvinist? This is a a point of debate amongst Baptist historians. continues to be a debate even to this day. Now, let me define terms for those of you who may be unaware of what hyper-Calvinism actually is. It's a term that we throw around from time to time as being part of a Reformed Baptist church, but I want to give you kind of the historical understanding of what this term means, and then we'll tease out whether or not Gill may have fit the bill. Historically, there's two, at least two underlying features that we could say identifies hyper-Calvinism. First, 
Hyper-Calvinism denies that God commands all who hear the gospel of Jesus Christ to believe in Him for salvation. That's one feature of hyper-Calvinism. A denial that God commands all who hear the gospel of Jesus Christ to believe in Him for salvation. Secondly, hyper-Calvinism historically has denied that it's the responsibility of every Christian to share the gospel with all people indiscriminately. The denial that it's the responsibility of every Christian to share the gospel with all people indiscriminately. Now, to be fair to Gill, some who charge him with being a hyper-Calvinist will, will find that this tendency was more prevalent in his writing ministry than in his preaching ministry. There are highly esteemed Baptist historians such as Timothy George and Tom Nettles who would argue um, it's not even justified to regard John Gill as a hyper-Calvinist in any respect, whether his writing or preaching ministry being considered. He just doesn't fall under the, the broader umbrella of hyper-Calvinism according to Baptist historians such as these. Others, such as Michael Haken, would argue differently, but would concede that it's much more prevalent in his writing than in his preaching. But why would there even be contemplation or speculation as to Gill falling under this label of hyper-Calvinism? Why the debate at all? What was the issue? Well, for those who are persuaded that Gill is a hyper-Calvinist, they normally point to his doctrine of God's eternal justification of the elect. This idea of eternal justification. Let me define that for you. For Gill... The justification of God's elect, and I quote, is a sentence conceived in the mind of God, an act in God, all of whose acts in Him are eternal, end quote. What does that mean? Gill believed that when God decrees to elect sinners to salvation from eternity past, their actual justification occurs coterminously with that decree. So, what it, so, in other words, God decrees salvation and the elect are justified. No sooner does God decree in eternity than the elect are justified in eternity. That's Gill's understanding of eternal justification. Despite human beings not being created at the time in which the decree transpires in God, eternal justification espouses that the elect receive a true justification in eternity and the reprobate receive a true condemnation in eternity. So what is the logical outworkings of this facet of theology? Well, if the elect are justified in eternity past, as are the reprobate condemned in eternity past, the logical outworking is this. Why should we extend a free offer of salvation to all men who hear the gospel? The elect will just believe on their own. They're already justified, just a matter of it being outworked in time. Why would God hold all men accountable to share the gospel with all people indiscriminately? Many of, whom would we, many of whom we would share the gospel with aren't even elect. So why share it with all people, says the adherent to this particular view. Now, given how God's absolute sovereignty was so forcefully opposed within Baptist circles in the 18th century, historians are left to wonder if Gill's zeal to safeguard this doctrine of God's sovereignty it may have led the pendulum to swing a little bit too far in the opposite direction. And I want to make an important note by sharing this, this blind spot or this error in Gill's theology. It's important for us to remember that when we do study figures in church history, all of our heroes of the faith, they were not only sinners in need of a Savior, just like us, but they were also creatures of a particular context. There's blind spots in all people's theology in a specific period of church history because of their sin and because of the context in which they find themselves in. And this observation should serve as a reminder that when we study figures from church history, we must hold their ideas, we must hold their lifestyle under the ultimate authority of God's Word. There's never a figure in church history that's not susceptible or open to correction from the Word of God, just like we ourselves are always open to potentially being corrected from the Word of God. We do not have perfect theology, as the old saying goes, um, we don't know where the errors are in our theology, because if we did, they wouldn't be there. Um, so we have blind spots. We're part of a particular historical and cultural context. And this was also the case with Gill. But let me just say this. 
Um, if you've heard some, some of the, 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 the negative comments made about Gil, whether it be through your own reading, through podcasts, or in a different venue, and, and you're hearing me uh, give this presentation on Gil's life and theology in Sunday school, and you're thinking, man, like, I'm really just kind of scared to study this guy because I don't want to be a hyper-Calvinist. Let me just appeal to you. This issue of Gill is so minuscule compared to the broader swath of his theological convictions and the way in which God used him in his respective context. You can chew the meat and you can spit out the bones. You can drink deeply from the well of theological and even doxological richness that comes through reading Gill. And again, this is a debated point. Was he truly a hyper-Calvinist? Um, I'm of the persuasion that if you're going to give him that charge, you do so in his theological writings, not in his preaching. But nonetheless, just be aware that as you study Gill, there are some blind spots potentially. There's error in everybody's theological system, but there's far more jewels than there is junk. And we should praise God for that. Now, a third element of Gill's theology, his theological commitments that he adhered to in his context And I think this really is a good segue uh, after we touch on this point into the pastoral or the practical applications that we can draw. Um, Gill modeled a faithful dependence on God's ordinary means of grace. A faithful dependence on God's ordinary means of grace. Question and answer 93 of the Baptist Catechism summarizes the normative means by which God saves and sanctifies His people. Question, what are the outward means whereby Christ communicateth to us the benefits of redemption? And the answer is this. The outward and ordinary means whereby Christ communicateth to us the benefits of redemption are His ordinances, especially the Word, baptism, the Lord's Supper, and prayer, all which means are made effectual to the salvation, or excuse me, uh, for the elect for salvation, end quote. So the corpus of John Gill's ministry reflects a man who was faithful to administer each of these means of grace that God ordinarily uses to save and to build up his saints within the context of the local church. And perhaps the most noteworthy example of Gill's dependence upon God's ordinary means of grace was his commitment to biblical exposition and his pulpit ministry. In all of Baptist history, I'm going to give you another superlative. You know, it's been said, I I like to paint with a broad stroke sometimes, but you know what, guys? I looked back in uh, at the art supply shop. I could only find the broad brush. So I'm going to give you a nice broad stroke here, uh, and you can take it or leave it. But in all of Baptist history, I'm going to argue that there may not have been a greater expositor of Scripture than John Gill. John Gill was a biblical expositor, and he was in a class of his own. At just the age of 26, this might scare some of you, makes me a little bit uncomfortable if I'm being honest, Gil would begin a 122 sermon series to the Song of Solomon, which may be the greatest treatment of that oft-neglected Old Testament book in church history. And as I previously noted in this lesson, Gil's produced a commentary on every verse in the Bible. And if you read his commentaries, kid you not, read the commentaries, you'll find the footnotes Gill demonstrating his proficiency in the biblical languages. He's looking at the Hebrew. He's looking at the Aramaic. He's looking at the Greek, the Latin. And he's giving you commentaries on the original languages as well as on the English language that you find in Scripture. And oftentimes, Gill's interacting with contemporaries, sometimes even Jewish theologians going all the way back into the first century context when dealing with the New Testament, that is. So so Gill's commentaries, they're robust just as a commentary itself, but they're they're just so rich with all of these other vignettes that you just sit there reading, and and it's like the floodgates are open, and you're just getting information overload time and time again. It's fascinating. It's great stuff. Read his commentaries. It's available for free online. We also find, though, that all of Gill's doctrinal works It wasn't just the byproduct of philosophical speculation. It wasn't written as all of these musings that Gill had about a particular concept or a particular controversy. Every time Gill develops a point, it's saturated with Scripture. 
Gil was not merely an ivory tower academic who wanted to impress you with how much he knew. He knew a lot. But Gil was always trying to bring things back to the Word of God. He wanted to show his readers how his conclusions could be harmonized ultimately with the very resource that he was using to get those conclusions, namely the Scriptures. Gil wanted to be biblical from start to finish. In fact, J.C. Philpot, the revered 19th century Baptist theologian, he gives us a snapshot of how Gill was perceived as a biblical expositor in his own generation. I love this. I agree with what Philpot notes. He said, as an expositor of Scripture, Gill shines with unrivaled luster. He dug so deeply into the minds of heavenly truth and turned up such massive ore that there is dust of gold in all that he lays bare and brings to the light of day through his exposition of Scripture, end quote. So in the final analysis, John Gill, he's a model to be imitated by Baptists and non-Baptists alike in his commitment to classical or orthodox Trinitarianism, his high view of God's sovereignty, and his faithful dependence on God's ordinary means of grace, namely the faithful teaching and preaching of God's Word. So aside from his views on eternal justification, I heartily commend Gill's theology to you. Read his works, study his works, study his life. Be richly edified from doing so. But that brings us now to that third and final point that I want us to note by way of application. We've addressed the high points of John Gill's life. We've unpacked some key distinctives of John Gill's theology. And now in the few minutes that we have remaining in Sunday school, I want us to very briefly um, consider why Baptists should study John Gill. Why bother studying Gill? Or, you know, um, you know, you could make even a broader application. Why does church history matter? Well, if a figure meets some of these distinctives that I'm going to give you this morning, I think they're worthy of being studied uh, and worthy of even being imitated. Why should we study Gill? Let me give you just three reasons. Three, what I would say are compelling reasons for studying John Gill. The first reason why we should study Gill is because he demonstrates a zeal for truth that's tempered with grace. He had a zeal for truth that was tempered with grace. We live in an age where clickbaits, sound bites, and pithy one-liners reign supreme. It's often easy for self-identifying Christians to get sucked into the popular trends of our world. Far too many self-identifying believers, I see it all the time on Twitter, they feel this unquenchable need to correct every minutia of theological error and, and, and they do so in such a way that it's as if this is the hill to die on. And if you're not on board with this issue, then you're a heretic, you're an unbeliever, we should have nothing to do with you. Zeal for truth that's commendable. No grace. No love. No graciousness. No gentleness or respect that God calls us to model in our defense of the faith. We should always be ready to give a hope that is in us, but yet do so with gentleness and respect, says Peter in 1 Peter 3.15. Now, how did Gill deal with controversy in his day? There's a lot of controversy, a lot of attacks on the doctrine of the Trinity, a lot of attacks on God's sovereignty in the 18th century Baptist context. What would Gill do in, 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 in distinction from what's so often demonstrated by Christians in our day? Well, Gill, he would develop lengthy responses to those who he had uh, issues with or to those that he had differences with. But as he developed these lengthy responses, he would go to great pains, great lengths, to to refuse to create straw men, to refuse to engage in personal attacks or ad hominem forms of argumentation. Gill wanted to faithfully represent the best of what the other side was arguing for and then show why he believed from the Scripture that perspective to be an error. And then he would ordinarily flesh out the very real and concrete implications that would come with holding to the error versus holding to the truth. So Gill's writings were certainly very apologetical and polemical many of the times in his context that he lived in. They had to be due to all the controversies. But Gill never made it his intention. I'm sure he fell short in this, as we all do, but he never made it his intention to slander his opposition, or to to, to, to elevate issues of non-essentiality to a standard for orthodoxy. 
He showed grace with other genuine Christians that he disagreed. He wanted to represent them as clearly as he possibly could. But if it was a foundational issue of orthodoxy, he would still, even though stressing, hey, this is a major issue, and if we disagree on this, we're outside the bounds of Christian orthodoxy. Even at that point, he would still do everything in his power to faithfully represent the opposition, to respond to it with grace and respect, and to show implications with holding to one view versus the other. This should be our efforts, brethren. We shouldn't be those who slander. We shouldn't be those who, who yell or act unbecomingly toward others that we disagree, even on important issues. We can be stern, we can be bold, but we can do so with grace and respect and, and, and just a general concern for the welfare of their soul um, with, without going down the road into inappropriate behavior, which we so often find in our day. So that's the reason we should study Gill. He had a zeal for truth that was tempered with grace. Second reason why Baptists should study Gill is because he demonstrates faithful longevity in Christian ministry. He was faithful for over 50 years in Christian ministry. And over the past some 30 to 40 years in America alone, maybe even going back to, to 50 years now as we get closer to 2030, um, we live in a day where the, the rise of mega churches and the rise of large platforms are, are, are viewed kind of as, as the epitome or the pinnacle of what it means to be successful in ministry. Ministry tends to be viewed more in our day as a business versus a calling. And it's not uncommon for young men recently out of seminary, and I say this as a young man myself, to view the first pastor as, as a stepping stone. I'm going to get out of seminary and get my feet wet in the ministry for a few years. Then I'm going to get to this role. And then when I finish this academic degree, that's going to make my resume look a little bit better. Then I'm going to go to this bigger church, and I'm going to get a little bit more Twitter following and a little bit more notoriety, and then maybe I can speak at some conferences down the road. It's a temptation that a lot of modern-day Christian, American evangelical ministers have to face. It's not so much about faithfully laying down the life to, to labor in obscurity, potentially, to not have all the bells and whistles and the big platform that comes in American evangelicalism. That mindset is becoming less and less prevalent. It's now about me and what my ministry can become, what my ministry can represent. It's not about, hey, God, where are you calling me to serve? And if it's not going to get me famous, if it's not going to get me rich, if it's not going to get me opportunities to speak at conferences, so be it. I want to love you and serve you and your people. That mindset is what Gil had for some 52 years. As he said about being called the doctor, I neither, I neither thought it, sought it, or bought it. The, the accolades, that's in God's hands. I'm going to love God's people and serve God's people where he's called me for as long as he's called me to do so. And by his grace, he did it for some 52 years. So you want to see faithful endurance through hardships in ministry and, and a man who just ran the Christian race well, falling short, sinner, just like us, but he ran well for over half a century. You want to see an example? Look to John Gill. Great example of balancing just, just faithful endurance and a contentment with where God placed him for over half a century. But lastly, the last practical reason that uh, can direct us to study Gill is that he demonstrated how God alone is worthy of our supreme adoration. Gill did not view himself as the hero of his own story. It was the triune God who was the hero of Gill's life and his ministry. Certainly true that John Gill was one of the greatest Baptists that God raised up to champion and safeguard Christian orthodoxy in an era where biblical truth was just being significantly ignored or disregarded. Not to the extent that we see it in the 21st century, but there's definitely a downward trend beginning with the rise of Enlightenment thinking. Biblical truth being discarded. Um, a, a lot of people not necessarily being as receptive to the things of God as they previously were. Gill, he took that all as it was in his day, and he had his mindset on, I'm going to focus on doing what God's called me to do above anything else. I'm going to be faithful to my wife. I'm going to be faithful to God's word. And no matter how many accomplishments I have in ministry, it's all for naught if God not be glorified. 
God's the hero of my story. It's not about me. It's not about my platform. And, and even so, it's, it's not even about ultimately the people of whom I'm able to impact, though he certainly had a heart for people. It's all about the glory and praise of God. Brethren, as we look to Gil and we look to others who have a God's eye perspective on their life and ministry, what we're going to find ourselves doing as we read their testimonies, we're going to worship and we're going to adore the God of our salvation. So would God help us, whether we study Gil, whether we study other heroes of the faith, would God help us to use Christian biography to adore God more, to want to obey God with greater fervency, and to want to proclaim the excellencies of our faith to those that God gives us the opportunity to do so with. That's how Gil has impacted me. I hope that's how it will impact you if you take the time to study Gil. But if you don't study Gil, find a man or a woman from church history who was faithful to Scripture, faithful to what God called them to do. And hopefully as you study that individual, you'll find your heart being directed to the Lord. You'll find your affections being increased for the Lord. And the end result will be deeper worship and adoration of the triune God. But having said that, I've gone four minutes over our allotted time. So let me pray. Uh, we'll take a few minutes uh, to fellowship, to use restroom, and prepare our hearts for our time of corporate worship in a few moments. So let's pray. We'll be dismissed.